you're watching Swipe. Here's a little taste of what we've got for you in the next 10 minutes. Inside your mind, Angela's looking at the effects of technology on our brains. Assistant, I'd like to play, play the cactus. I get a go on the gadget that apparently turns pretty much anything into a musical instrument. And watch out, we'll be in the dangerous world of Sniper Ghost Warrior 3 in this week's Games Review. Welcome to Swipe. We're going to kick off with a bit of a thinker this week. It might even be a warning. You know how some people say a constant reliance on technology could eventually turn our brains to mush? Yeah, well, we wanted to look into that, especially after some of us got a whole load of new gadgets for Christmas. Here's Angela. A top neuroscientist believes electronic devices affect our personality, our behavior and our characteristics. Baroness Greenfield says for children, it can impair their ability to learn important social skills. And for adults, it can be socially isolating. What we're seeing are people now um, who have a rather fragile sense of identity, a rather short attention span, slightly adversarial, not very good at personal communication, very self-referential, needing stimulation all the time. A bit like three-year-olds, but the sadness is that they're older. Some specialists argue having a short attention span could be from the underdevelopment of the right side of the brain, which is linked to concentration. That's supporting the idea that technology overload with the overuse of smartphones and other devices reduces our attention. But other studies suggest that playing on gaming consoles can help develop the left side of the brain, linked to problem solving. The idea that technology upsets the balance of the left and right side of the brain is based on theories and specialists argue there's little evidence to support those claims. So we, we conducted the scans right here. A senior researcher at University College London has been looking into this. He studies brain activity patterns using an MRI experiment by seeing what happens to people when they are given information to remember with and without the help of setting external reminders on a device. What we find is that this part of the brain is very active when people are just resting. If we then give them some information to remember, it completely shuts down. People are thinking so hard about storing this information in their brain they stop thinking about other things. But then, when we allow them to set external reminders and to outsource that memory to an external device, this activity comes right back again. We're in an era where most of us outsource our memory to the web, GPS, calendar alerts and calculators, and our reliance on it and the effects are debatable. But this new evidence suggests using technology to assist us could actually be helping us to use our minds more productively for other things. Angela Barnes, Sky News. Time now for a quick roundup of some of this week's tech news, but stick around because after that, I'm going to show you how to play a cactus. Tim Peake's returning to space on a second mission. The announcement came while the astronaut was at the Science Museum this week, where the spacecraft that famously took him to the International Space Station has gone on display. It's not yet known, though, when he'll be heading back to space. A new app's launched to help pregnant women get a seat on public transport. Baby on board sends an alert to passengers within 15 feet, letting them know if there's a pregnant lady in need of a seat. Commuters must have installed a version of the app to get the notifications, though. Samsung announced what caused its Galaxy Note 7 phones to explode or catch fire last year. It's blamed faulty batteries. Samsung humiliatingly recalled millions of Note 7s before killing off the device completely last October. Stick around for our games review in just a few minutes. Velvet's taking revenge in the 16th instalment in the Tales of series. But before that... Now, if you're a regular Swipe viewer, you'll know we've looked at various music tech projects in the past, from entirely new instruments to drumless drum kits. But this week, I want to show you a gadget with the kind of musical power we've not featured on Swipe before. The inventors say it can turn everyday items into musical instruments. Take a look. just played a table. How yes. have you managed to turn a table into a piano? 
Well, it's thanks to this device here, it's the Mojis Play. It's a sensor that can uh, sense all the vibrations that we make when we interact with physical objects around us. It transforms that into a signal that can go to your iPad or your iPhone, where one of our apps will turn this into music on the fly. So you say this can turn any object into an instrument? Yes, exactly. Anything? Anything. Okay, I'm going to need some assistance with this. Now let's have an object. Yes, please, a watering can. We all have these at home. I'd like you to play the watering can, please, Bruno. For sure. Can I play something on the plastic robot? What if I want to play a different instrument? Because I notice it's all piano so far. We made a, an app called Keys that actually changes the sound based on the object it is playing. I'd like a cactus, please. Bruno, can you turn this into a harp? Is your ultimate aim to do away with other instruments, just have people playing mojis. There's no need for any <laughs> real instrument. No, I, I, absolutely no, no. So the the idea here is really is to break in the barrier for uh, everyone to experience how it is to be a musician. So can it make me a better musician? Yes, absolutely. Really? I can guarantee that. Yes. You guarantee it. Yes. <laughs> that's quite that's quite a claim. <laughs> but I heard you're a pretty good musician on the watermelon. Yeah. Is that true? Hours and hours spent playing watermelon. Uh, assistant, I'd like a watermelon, please. <laughs> mm, how about a bit of Beethoven on that? <laughs> well done. That's the best watermelon playing I've ever seen. Video games review time now, and this week we've got Alicia with her pick of new titles. Sniper Ghost Warrior 3 is an open world first person shooter that's set in the modern day, and you play as a guy called John North, who's an American Marine who's been dropped somewhere in Eastern Europe, just outside of Russia, in an attempt to stop the next Cold War. I mean, hopefully we'll get to a point one day where Cold Wars are avoided by reasoned discussions between politicians over tea and biscuits, but it's certainly not that way today, and it probably wouldn't make a great video game. So instead, we're getting John and his big guns. So you can either go in, guns blazing, trying to kill everyone in sight, or you can be more subtle, more intelligent, and you can choose your loadout more carefully before going. Use equipment like drones, and basically try and ghost your way through a mission. It's a really, really clever game. It's not revolutionary, but it's an example of what games of this type can achieve on this current generation of consoles. Last year, IO Interactive decided to release its new Hitman game in a bit of a different form. They decided that they'd release it episodically. Now, that had a mixed reaction from fans. Some people loved it because they felt that they could really get into the nitty gritty of an episode before the next one was released two months later. Others really didn't like it. They felt like they were being told when they had to game, that their experience was being served to them and they didn't have this sense of control. So IO Interactive has now decided that it's going to release a boxed version of the Hitman game. So that's all the episodes on one disc. For years, if you had a 15 hour game, you could choose to play it straight for 15 hours, or you could choose to play it in small hour long increments. But now with games and IO Interactive, they're pulling it back and doing episodes. There's this really weird mix going on with Hitman of traditional media consumption versus new media consumption. The game is available on January 31st. Tales of Berseria is a Japanese role-playing game, or JRPG for short. It tells the story of Velvet. She's the first female protagonist in the series, and she has a pretty dark past involving a werewolf claw and the death of her friends and family. So it, it's going down to some pretty dark places, but that's actually one of the most interesting things about this game. Both Velvet and her companions are pretty morally ambiguous, and that really affects the story, how they interact with the world, and how the world interacts with them. This is the 16th installment in the Tales of series, 
and it diverges slightly in places. It's essentially a revenge story of one woman against the person who wronged her. And narratively, that just makes the game one of the most interesting in the series. Saying that though, if you've not played the other 15 games before it, the 16th game you can just get straight into. You're not going to not understand what's going on because these characters are new as well to people who've been playing the games for years. Well, that's it from us. But don't forget you can watch any of our Swipe episodes on demand in all the usual places. And why not follow us on Twitter at Sky News Swipe to see what we get up to throughout the week. I'll be back next time. Hope you can join us then. Bye-bye.